Pretend Cloverfield Lane didn't need to be connected to the original Cloverfield movie in order to be a good story, but it does lend to some further background and lore attached to the characters, which I found intriguing and wanted to share. I will be discussing specifics about the movie that may spoil it for some who haven't seen it, so I recommend seeing the movie before continuing this video. The story behind Howard begins with him in the Navy. While in the Navy, he worked with satellites and started seeing things that led him to believe the end of the world was near. Howard saw something, something from outer space, something that scared him. But he was told to keep quiet by his superiors. He became paranoid, thinking the Soviets, North Korea, or even aliens were going to launch some sort of attack, and it was only a matter of time before the end of the world. Unsure of what was coming, he began building a bomb shelter in his backyard. A small one-room shelter, just big enough for him, his wife Denise, and his daughter Megan. Howard learned the creatures would come in three waves. First, major attacks in high populated areas such as cities. The second being sweeps of the smaller, localized locations hunting down the remaining humans. And finally, a full occupation of Earth. The original Cloverfield was this first wave a large, full-scale attack on large populated areas. While 10 Cloverfield Lane began at the time of the first wave, the bulk of the story takes place during the second wave, the cleanup wave. Constantly preparing for the end, Howard would spout his conspiracy theories and fears to his wife and daughter, saying that he was building a shelter to protect them. As Howard's paranoia grew, so did his wife's frustration. No longer being able to handle Howard's doomsday obsession, Denise packed up everything and left Howard, taking their 13-year-old daughter Megan with her. In addition to physically moving, Denise obtained a restraining order against him, putting even more distance between the three of them. Howard believed he would be able to get his daughter back if he was just able to build a new, cozier shelter for them so they could be a family again. Howard hired a local boy, Emmett, to help him complete the shelter in time. In order to fund the new shelter and further his prep for the end of the world, Howard got a job at a company called Bold Futura. Bold Futura was a subsidiary of the Tagaruto Corporation. It was Tagaruto's drilling at the bottom of the ocean, as well as its satellites that were to blame for the initial events in the first Cloverfield movie. Howard did such a good job, he was even employee of the month in February 2016. As promotion for the movie, they created an actual website for Howard's company you can go to it. It's tagaruto.jp and from there explore the site. The real interesting thing is, as you can see on Howard's shirt, it mentions Radio Man 70. If you go to the website radioman70.com, it redirects you to another site titled funandprettythings.com. This may all seem like a weird joke, but I promise as we dive deeper it will make sense. Next, there's an image which is a still of Molly Ringwald from the movie Pretty in Pink. This movie is important because most likely it was Megan's favorite movie. In 10 Cloverfield Lane, we see that Emmett mistakes the movie Howard's watching for 16 Candles, and in reality he corrects him, telling him it's Pretty in Pink. This image of Molly Ringwald is the only clickable image, and upon clicking, it opens up a prompt asking us for a paraphrase. And just like the scene referenced in the movie, we type do you want to talk? Immediately, we're taken to a conversation between Radio Man 70 and Radio Girl. Through this conversation, we learn that Radio Man 70 is obviously Howard, and Radio Girl is how Howard is referring to Megan. Through this conversation, we are able to dive deeper into the backstory between Howard and his family. We learn about the breakup between Howard and his wife and daughter. The conversation goes into detail about the past, entirely written by Howard, as he makes desperate attempts at getting his daughter back before it's too late. He even creates a lengthy descriptive list of how to handle specific survival situations that may arise. The dialogue draws to an end when Denise gets wind of Howard's attempts of having Megan return to him, and she responds to his pleas, telling him enough is enough and to go away and seek help. You can tell from the timestamps that this conversation lasts just about one afternoon. A little more than an hour passes, and then a mystery person named N.R. reaches out to Howard, instructing him time is of the essence and providing him with a strange audio file. The audio file starts off as a slow piano tune before turning into a mess of beeps. 
NR was someone Howard worked with in the past, and embedded in the song file was a warning to Howard that he was able to decipher. The warning was an image of a spaceship like the one we see at the end of the movie, headed to Earth. This was the moment Howard decided to kidnap Brittany. Brittany was the girl Howard claimed was his original daughter, Megan. Howard kidnapped Brittany, forcing her into the bomb shelter giving her all of Megan's old clothes and most likely telling her that she should be thankful and he was doing it for her own safety. With the end of the world right around the corner, all Howard wants is his daughter and to be a family again. In the movie, you can see the room that Michelle wakes up in is only half painted pink and has only begun to be decorated like a girl's room. This was to be Megan's room. Howard was only able to paint half of the room before he knew of the impending doom. With Brittany captured, she tried to escape multiple times, forcing Howard to install the scary door, a strong vault-like door on her room. Howard was never aware of Brittany making her way through the air vents and carving help into the glass with her bloodied earrings. This act for Brittany, most likely her final attempt at escape, broke her will, causing her to get into a confrontation with Howard upon his next visit to the bomb shelter. I imagine, due to either a mistake on Howard's behalf or more likely actions Brittany took upon herself, she sadly met her end. Howard most likely used the petrochloric acid to dispose of Brittany's body. Now alone, Howard continued to finish preparations. As fortune may have it, the night of the first attacks, Howard passes another potential surrogate daughter on his drive home. This time, it was Michelle. Howard rammed her car off the road, knocking her unconscious, as he was able to abduct her and take her into his shelter with him. Within the final moments of Howard bringing Michelle into the shelter and sealing the doors, Emmett, the boy who helped Howard build the shelter, runs over, pleading to be let in. Howard let Emmett in, and so begins what we see in the movie. Howard never intended for Emmett to be there. Of course he had enough food, but Howard had only built two rooms, one for him and one for his daughter Megan. As you remember, the first time you come across Emmett in the movie, he's tucked away in a tiny little corner, barely able to fit. Also, once Howard kills Emmett, he tells Michelle everything is okay and this is the way it was supposed to be. Howard cleans up, shaves, and offers Michelle ice cream before dinner, which was Megan's favorite. Throughout the movie, you can see Howard is still wearing a wedding ring on his finger. Howard just wanted to be part of a family again, him and his daughter. Howard's actions, although malicious and violent, were most likely created from good intentions gone horribly wrong. Howard was not a bad person, just faced with these extreme circumstances, he did the best he could. 10 Cloverfield Lane did a great job telling a story about hopelessness and overcoming your fears. Personally, I wish the movie didn't have the word Cloverfield in the title, because the ending would have been even more of a surprise. Also, this led a lot of people to enter this movie expecting to see a monster movie and only leaving disappointed. Even with the knowledge that most likely aliens were involved, I still found myself guessing right up to the very end on whether or not Howard was telling the truth. I enjoyed the way the story unfolded, and John Goodman's performance as Howard was remarkable. In this day and age, a lot of stories have debatably already been done, but even common stories can be told in a different and creative way, giving new life to an old tale. That's what I truly enjoyed about this movie. The fact that Howard had a whole history behind him that kept you guessing right up to the very end. And the more I thought about it, the more the story unfolded in my head, making me want to create and share this video. To me, that is great storytelling, a satisfying experience leaving you with a lot to think about and a lot to question, but still leaving you complete with a full, well-rounded story. Yeah.